Thanks. That was a, a good intro into my talk. Um, uh, uh, these are my disclosures. My most important disclosure is really the only arthroplasty I do is uh, cervical disc arthroplasty at this point. Um, I did do an orthopedic surgery residency. I tortured Jung Yu for, I don't know, was it six years, I think, right, Jung? Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, you know, we, we, this is a kid's song, you know, about the hip bone connected to the knee bone and all that. Um, but really, we have thought about the pelvis and the lower lumbar spine really, you know, in isolation in some respects for a very, very long time. But really, who the, the sort of the patient group now that, you know, we're starting to see be affected by these spinal fusions, and that includes both the SI joint and the hip joint, are, of course, hip arthroplasty patients. So... Um, we know that about 40% of arthroplasty patients do have some age-related uh, degenerative disc disease. Of course, it has to do with the age of the patient getting the hip arthroplasty. Um, one of the highest risks of impingement, um, and for those of you who um, you know, are not familiar with what impingement is, basically you've got a ball in a cup, um, but this ball can actually you know, essentially hit the cup. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, if you have something levering on a cup, um, that cup's going to loosen. And you either get an implant loosening or you get what's called osteolysis behind it. Um, and it oftentimes requires a revision of a, of a hip joint. Um, and again, for the nurses in the group, a, a revision hip, you know, maybe one you can get away with, but man, patients never walk normally even after a first revision. Um, and then by a second or a third one, they really are pretty disabled. So this is a problem, actually. So um, the other significant risk of increased risk of dislocation, of course, is impingement. Um, and it's significantly increased in patients who have what's been now termed spinal stiffness. Um, what's the other problem? Well, of course, the hip surgeons really try to predict, you know, who will or who won't be a dislocator based on, again, how these implants are placed. Um, and for those of you who do or don't remember, and I, I, I honestly had to look this up, um, what uh, coronal cup position actually means, but basically it's essentially what, how the cup is placed on an AP radiograph. Um, and then there's this angle here, I believe it's called the inclination or ant antiversion, which we'll talk about in a, in a later slide. But ultimately, you can't look at this x-ray and, and determine whether or predict whether or not the patient will or won't dislocate post-op. Um, so the hip surgeons have said, well, geez, maybe there's a different way to look at the cup instead of just looking at it on an AP. And again, as orthopedic surgeons, even as spine surgeons, right, we're always like looking at orthogonal images. Um, so why just a lateral x-ray doesn't always help you. Uh, and so they said, well, why don't we look at sagittal pelvic parameters and then they started delving into the world of spine surgery, saying, oh my god, these guys have already started looking at this extensively, as Ray very nicely pointed out, for the last 10 years. Um, so this is, this is a hip surgeon's interpretation of pelvic parameters, which is mostly correct. But this adds, again, um, um, Ray initially introduced it. So obviously sacral slope and pelvic incidence are things that we're very familiar with. Um, and, uh, just as a, you know, uh, a point, pelvic incidence, PI obviously doesn't change. It's an anatomical measurement. So whether you're sitting, lying down, sideways, PI won't change. Sacral slope uh, obviously does because that's based on the horizontal um, with gravity. Um, another measurement they take is what's called the pelvic femoral angle, which essentially is the uh, dorsal uh, aspect of S1, the hip center, and a parallel line down the femoral shaft. Now, really the critical, um, oh, and uh, the star points out a, what they call anti-inclination because it incorporates both uh, cup antiversion and cup inclination. Um, standing to lying down really doesn't change the, um, these figures that much, obviously sacral slope, but um, it's really going from sitting. Now, sitting generally, we assume, requires about 90 degrees of flexion between the lumbar spine and the thigh. Um, and what changes most, of course, is the pelvic femoral angle, okay? But it's not, uh, it's not always a 90% hip flexion. It's about somewhere between 55 and 70 degrees. It's really, the 20, it's really the change in the sacral slope that matters here the most. Um, and essentially what normal 
sitting relies upon is a change in sacral slope of about 20 degrees, okay? Um, and so you can kind of in real life, in fact, this was done on an EO, so it's a little blurry, but here are the angles kind of in real life and what they look like. And again, sitting. Now you can see in this patient, um, she has a pelvic femoral angle that's a bit larger than 180, it's about 190 degrees. Now, it's sort of beyond this talk, but um, high PI and low PI uh, patients have different parameters. But again, you can see really the sac how the sacral slope changes and the anti-inclination changes. So the early literature basically found that um, patients who are highest risk of dislocation uh, have, in general, a what's called a stiff lower spine. They found that dislocators have much less spinal flexion, uh, lower change in sacral slope, uh, and significantly higher hip flexion. Again, that's where the impingement comes in um, because the arthroplasty uh, implants can't accommodate the degree of hip flexion required. And there's a significantly negative correlation between hip flexion and spine range of motion, which, again, makes tremendous intuitive sense, uh, but it's just being you know, really kind of elucidated in literature that this is now a problem. Um, this study recently came out in terms of timing. Now, this is a Medicare database study where they looked at you know, fairly large numbers of patients who had spinal fusions prior to having hip replacement, and then having a hip, hip replacement first and a spinal fusion later. Um, they looked at one year, two years, and five years post-hip arthroplasty. Um, and basically, so the purple line that you see is the spinal fusion first, and essentially, they have, you know, essentially a larger incidence of um, hip dislocation and uh, about a 50%, 40% increased risk of having revision surgery if you had a spinal fusion first. Now, their conclusion, I thought, was totally nonsensical. They, you know, they kind of said, well, maybe you should wait for five years to do a, you know, spinal fusion after a patient gets a hip arthroplasty, that, which, I mean, they even, they admittedly said, you know, we get it, but, you know, there's clearly something um, that, that a spinal fusion does to the stability of a hip. Um, so in conclusion, in a way, it's sort of not our problem. It's really the arthroplasty surgeon's problem, to be honest with you, unless you also do hip arthroplasties, then it is your problem. Um, but really, what I think the take home is for us is that doing spinal fusions in these patients with hip arthroplasties may actually create an adverse outcome of their hip. and. You know, is it our responsibility? I don't know, but I think it's worthwhile having a discussion with the patient and perhaps with, you know, his or her arthroplasty surgeon about what that spinal fusion is going to mean, particularly if you're doing a, you know, something in the lower lumbar spine fusion to the pelvis. Thank you.